Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another Mystery Week episode. I just want to apologize for missing yesterday's Mystery Week. I am so incredibly sorry, but I am actually so sick right now. Yesterday, I just couldn't even get out of bed. Like, it was really bad. Um, but today, I got Carrie to go get me some Codrill. I'm feeling well enough to film at the moment. I just put on a lot of extra makeup to try and not look so sick, but my under eyes and my eyes are just looking a little bit wonky. I really wish that I had pre-filmed these videos, but as some of you may know, I'm actually in the process of moving house right now um, and having to get the old house ready and Carrie's been working, so I've been doing it all myself and I've had a lot of stuff on my plate lately so I just had absolutely no time to pre-film these um I do it to myself honestly like <laughs> I just stress myself out so bad with these things it's probably why I'm getting sick is from stress uh so yeah I just want to apologize for letting you guys down yesterday I'm so sorry but I still of course will be uploading all of my mystery week videos so don't worry about that and yeah let's get into the case so in today's video, we are going to be talking about the abduction and murder of James Patrick Bulger, also known as Jamie Bulger. This case is by far the most heartbreaking case that I have ever looked into. And I literally cried when researching it. It is so, so sad. I do just want to warn anyone that this case does involve the murder of a two-year-old boy so it may not be for everyone but just considering the outcome of this case I do think it's really important to keep talking about and to just keep the case alive. So James Bolger was born on the 16th of March in 1990 and was just two years old one month off his third birthday when he was murdered. He was born in Liverpool in Merseyside to Denise Bolger, who is now Denise Fergus, and Ralph Bolger, and at the time of his abduction and murder, the family lived together in Kirby, which was also in Merseyside. He was described as this young boy who was full of energy from the moment he woke up to the moment that he went to sleep, and he was also described as just the sweetest little boy with the kindest heart, like when he was playing with his cousins and they wanted to play with the toy he was playing with, he would give it to them straight away and just find another toy for him to play with. So yeah, he was just a lovely little boy, even at the young age of two. On the 12th of February in 1993, Denise and her brother's fiance took her niece and James to the New Strand Shopping Center, which was in Bootle. This was a two-story shopping center with over a hundred shops, so it was a pretty large shopping center. They first went to the photo expert store and lined up in the queue to get some film developed, and then they had a look around a few other stores like Marks and Spencers. They also went into Tesco before going to TR time which was a butcher at 3 40 p.m which would have been their last stop and they were just popping in to get some meat for Ralph's dinner and this whole time Denise had been holding James's hand it was actually his first time to the shops without his stroller so she was holding his hand the whole time he was getting a little bit restless I mean he was two and they had been out all day it was the first time without his stroller and I can't imagine shopping as fun for a two-year-old so he was getting a little bit restless but at the butcher Denise was holding his hand she let go for literally like a minute just to get her purse out get her wallet like her money out of her purse give it to the butcher, butcher grab her product back and put her money back in her purse and her purse back in her bag so it would have taken a minute or two but when she looked back down to grab James's hand he was gone of course Denise started to worry she started looking around the butcher she was looking around the area surrounding the butcher the store surrounding the butcher but couldn't find James anywhere so immediately she went to like the information desk and she described what he looked like, what he was wearing, and told them that he was missing. So at 4.15, they put a call out for him over the speakers in the hopes that somebody would recognize him, recognize what he was wearing, and bring him up to the service desk. But unfortunately, this didn't happen. Staff then helped Denise search around the shopping center. They looked the whole thing. And like I said, it was a pretty big shopping center, over 100 stores, two stories. And they all they looked all over it but could not find any signs of James. 
At this time, they also called the police who came. They helped search not only the shopping center, but started to look around the shopping center in the surrounding neighborhoods and surrounding streets because if the worst had happened and he was abducted, then obviously they would have left the shopping center. He was taken at 3.40 p.m., so it's highly likely that he wouldn't have been in the shopping center anymore if this was the case. Police ended up getting helicopters, traffic patrols, over 100 officers and friends and family, loved ones of James searching everywhere for him. But Denise wasn't one of these people because police had actually taken her into the station for questioning. They were asking her any sort of questions they could about what he was wearing, you know, just trying to figure out their last movements to see what could have possibly happened. So they had her there for about 24 hours just trying to get any information they could to help aid in the search of James. After the Strand Shopping Center had closed, police came back and they actually called in workers from the specific shops that Denise and James had visited to come in and open the shops so they could search in there in case James was locked in one or hiding in one somewhere. Gaynor Davis came in from the photo expert to open it up and they checked in like a large like wooden pigeonhole where they usually kept their prints in case he had maybe slipped in there and had some sort of nap or whatever, um, which isn't totally unlikely. I know that I did that when I was younger. I hid in like a cupboard at a shopping center and had to sleep and my parents freaked out. They had everybody searching for me. So it wasn't too far-fetched that he could have been hiding and just having a nap in one of these areas and got locked in. But unfortunately, James was nowhere to be found and their search turned up nothing. About 24 hours after Denise had discovered that James was missing, the staff at the Strand Shopping Center looked through their 16 CCT cameras and found footage of James leaving the center with two young boys. As I'm sure you guys are well aware, CCTV footage is really, really bad quality. It's extremely grainy. And usually very hard to make out the people in the footage. But um, so they weren't able to identify the two boys that James was with. But Denise was able to identify James himself because of the clothes that he was wearing. The boys in the CCTV footage looked really young. So this kind of gave everyone, everyone kind of breathed a sigh of relief. They were confident at this point that they would get James back because, I mean, they didn't think boys so young would have malicious intentions. They thought maybe James had run away and they'd found him, tried to help him out or something. They were just glad that he wasn't with a pedophile or something. So the CCTV footage was released to the public in the hopes that somebody would recognize the boys and Denise made a very heart-wrenching appeal to the public via the media, um, asking for any information, any leads, if anyone had seen James. Just buying me of the butch just turns away from for a minute and then I look down and I've gone, if you've got me baby, just bring them back. Unfortunately, neither of these things turned anything up, so the search for James continued. Two days later, Terence and James Riley, who were just 13 years old at the time, were hanging out or walking past the railway line at Walton, which is unfortunately when they found James's mutilated body. And this was about two and a half miles from the Strand Shopping Center. The boys were hysterical. They ran straight to police who were only, the police station was like 300 meters away from where the body was found, I think. And they ran straight to police and they were just in hysterics and told them what they had found. I honestly cannot even imagine how traumatizing that would have been. Not only finding a dead toddler, but just the way in which they would have found him would have been so incredibly traumatic. Um, both Terence and James ended up getting into drugs. They suffered from PTSD because of it and ended up getting into a life of crime basically, which Terence has come out in an interview saying that 
he does partly blame it on the discovery of the body because he just suffered so much trauma from that that he turned to drugs and alcohol. The discovery was honestly a shock to the entire world because the last time James was seen was with two young boys and people thought that was a good thing. People thought that you know, two young boys couldn't have done anything to hurt James. At this point, the only lead that police had was the CCTV footage, so they did try and have it enhanced, but unfortunately it didn't work. They also decided to release information about the abduction in the hopes that somebody would come forward with some sort of information. I mean, the railway was two and a half miles away and these boys were young boys, so they wouldn't have been able to drive and it was safe to assume that they would have walked and so there would have been witnesses. Police also questioned over 60 young boys between the ages of 13 and 16 that had been in some sort of trouble because between 13 and 16 is the age that they believed the boys in the CCTV footage were. A few days passed and finally police received their first solid lead. They got a call from a woman who claimed to be Susan Venable's friend and said that the boy in the CCTV footage was John Venables who had skipped school that day with his friend Robert Thompson. These boys were just 10 years old so police didn't think that they had anything to do with it but it was their only solid lead so they decided to go and question the boys and just kind of rule them out. So one team of detectives went to John Venable's house and another team went to Robert Thompson's house and they were just trying to rule them out. They were questioning them about, you know, what they were doing that day, if they had skipped school, what they knew about the James Bolger abduction and murder, and the boys started freaking out. And that day, the detectives arrested 10-year-old John Venables and Robert Thompson. So before we go any further, let me give you a little bit of background information about these boys. John Venables was born on the 13th of August, 1983 to Susan Venables and Neil Venables. He was the second of three children and had a younger sister and older brother, both of which had learning disabilities. His parents were working class people and his father, Neil, worked as a forklift driver for a little while before losing his job. They were also separated at the time of the murder with uh, Susan living with her mother looking after her because uh, her father had actually passed away and nobody was there to look after her mother and Neil was living about a mile away. Despite living separately, they did try to raise their children with a united front. So for a certain amount of time a week, they would live with Susan, and then for uh, the rest of the week, they would live with their father, Neil. So Susan, as I mentioned, was living and looking after her mother, and she was also looking after her children, two of which had special needs, and on top of this, she was dealing with the separation, and she was just really struggling with juggling it all. She started drinking to try and cope and would often leave the children at home alone by themselves. And one time the police were actually called because she left them at home while she went to a bar for three hours. This, or I can only assume this is what had an effect on John's home life. He started acting up both at school and at home, which made Susan's struggle all the more hard on her but he kind of felt left out because his siblings he felt got more attention than him because they did have special needs so he just felt like his mum focused on them more I guess although she maintains that they all received equal treatment equal amounts of her time and equal love. Both his younger sister and older brother attended a special needs school while he attended Broad Square Julia, which was just a normal primary school or elementary school. I'm not sure what they call it in the UK. Unfortunately, John was being bullied both at school and by kids in his neighborhood and he just really started acting out. He would grab his desk and he would rock back and forwards, making moaning noise and other weird noises. He would run around the classroom and just rip all of the work off of the walls. Um, he would curl up under a group of desks so that nobody could reach him. He started getting violent. He threatened teachers. And one time he actually tried to strangle another student by putting a ruler up to his neck. And it took two teachers 
to get him off of this other child, which ended up getting him suspended for two days. He would also cut himself with scissors as well as cut his socks, and he was acting up as at home as well, which Susan said, and as I mentioned, she was really struggling already, dealing with her mum, her separation, and her other two children. So the fact that James was acting up on top of this was really taking a toll on her. John actually seemed like he was trying to replicate some of the behaviours that his brother and sister had, and it seemed like he was doing this not only to get more of his mother's attention, but also in the hopes that he would be able to change schools. He often talked about wanting to change schools because of the bullying and he thought that their school, because it was a special needs school, would be more tolerant and that he wouldn't get bullied there. His mother ended up taking him out of school for 10 days as punishment, which seems like a weird punishment to me because he wanted to leave school, so I'm not sure what that was about, but she took him out of school for 10 days. His grades ended up suffering because of this and eventually she withdrew him from the school and enrolled him at St. Mary's Church of England Primary School, which is where Robert Thompson went and also where John Venables had to go back a grade and it was kind of like a fresh start for him. Robert was born just 10 days after John on the 23rd of August in 1983 and he was born into an extremely dysfunctional family. He was the fifth of seven children to Anne and Robert Thompson and his dad was an alcoholic who would often beat his mother Anne mercilessly and would beat her in front of the children and Anne had already come from an abusive family herself um, her dad would beat her as well and she actually married Robert to try and get out of the abusive situation that she was in with her father she ended up taking this out on her children as well beating them with sticks and ropes and other things so Robert the father ended up having an affair and he left the entire family and within the week that he left the entire family their house burned down in an accidental fire and this really kind of set Anne into a downward spiral. She tried to commit suicide soon after with pills and she just ended up becoming an alcoholic. She turned to alcohol and she just became withdrawn and left her children to look after each other, which really didn't happen. Quite the opposite happened actually. So the eldest kids started beating the kids that were younger than them and it was kind of like a cycle where the eldest would beat the younger kids, the younger kids would then beat the kids that are younger than them, and so on and so forth until it got to the last and youngest child who was 18 month old Ben. All of the children were troublemakers and the police knew who they were, one of them became an arsonist, two of them became thieves, one of them was known for sexually assaulting young children including his own brothers. It was just a horrible environment, they all skipped school really often and Robert would skip school with his younger brother Ryan who was like the fourth of seven kids and Robert was the fifth of seven kids and he would take Ryan and they would go to local shopping centers and just steal things together. He actually took Ryan to the same shopping center strand where James had been abducted and abandoned him there and Ryan was traumatized by this. He was crying, he didn't know what to do. A woman ended up coming and helping him and asking what was wrong which is when he told her what was going on. And this was after he had beaten Ryan and then just left him there. Anyway, Robert ended up skipping so much school. He skipped like a th over a third of the year and so much so that he ended up being held back a year and he was going to the school that John Venables was transferred to. They were in the same class and they both were the eldest in the class. They went through very similar things. Both their mothers attempted suicide. Um, they both didn't really have father figures. They were the two eldest kids in their grade. So yeah, they ended up becoming very fast friends and ended up skipping school together quite often. Okay, so that is most of the background information on those two. So I guess that brings us back to the case. 
Both boys were sent to completely separate police stations for questioning. They had over 20 interviews over a span of three days. Robert Thompson had his mother Anne there with him as well as his solicitor. John Venables also had his mother Susan, his father Neil and a solicitor in the interviews with him. So I'm just going to go over the interviews pretty briefly because I mean it's easy to summarize and if I went into extreme detail it would just be unnecessary and this video would literally go for four hours but I will leave a link in the description so you can listen to some of the footage of the interviews that took place. So basically when they first got in there they both denied everything. Robert was the first to admit that they had abducted and murdered James Bulger but he blamed the entire thing on John saying he was just a bystander and just kind of watched it all happen but didn't actually do anything. He said John was the one who abducted him, he said John was the one who tortured him and he said that he begged John to take the baby back. Meanwhile John was still denying everything, he was denying the fact that he was even at the Strand shopping centre so they told him that Robert had admitted that they took him to the railway and John literally freaked out. He got up, he was crying, he was like attacking his dad, like he literally freaked out. He said that the two of you were in the Strand and that you saw the little boy. We never. We never. Is that the God's honest truth? God's honest truth. He's a liar. Calm down. Oh my gosh. Oh, no, it's alright. Come on. It's alright. Come on. Oh, nice. I never got the boy. So, he was also kind of scared to have his mum in the room and, like, didn't want her to think badly of him and was scared of what she'd think. So, Detectives kind of caught on to this, pulled both parents aside and were like, you just need to reassure him that you love him and that he's okay. So that is exactly what they did. Susan said, you know, we will love you no matter what, which is when he admitted to everything. Except, the twist is, he also blamed the entire thing on Robert. You had a conversation with your mum and you then requested that myself and Dave Tanner come into the room. And what was it you told us? That I can James. So they were just kind of blaming each other and police had their confession at this point. So they knew that even if they started admitting to things themselves, they just assumed they would never get the entire story. So they kind of had to start piecing together the timeline and the events that took place themselves with which they could do so with forensic evidence and witnesses. There was 38 witnesses who saw the two boys with James on the way to the railway line, which is fucking crazy to me that these people could have literally saved his life. And oh, this part really frustrates me, but we will get into this a little bit later and you guys will see why it's so freaking annoying. So using forensic evidence and witness statements, they were able to get a timeline of what happened to two-year-old James Bulger. Firstly, they found blood on the shoelaces of Robert Thompson, and they also found the same shoelaces imprinted on James's face. There was also paint left in James's eye and a whole bu bunch of other evidence at the scene, which we'll get into how that's all related to the boys later on. So on the 12th of February in 1993, Robert Thompson and John Venables skipped school together. They went to the shopping centre to steal things as usual. They stole a whole bunch of things like some blue paint, um, some batteries and a whole bunch of other things. While James and Denise were waiting in the queue to get their film developed, the two boys were actually upstairs trying to steal another or abduct another toddler, which didn't work. The mother saw them and started yelling at her kid to come back. So... That didn't work and that was about an hour or so before James's abduction. So about an hour later they abducted James from out front of AR Time the butcher. They first took him just outside of the Strands shopping centre to try and push him in front of a car to kill him 
but that didn't work for them for some reason. They then took him to a nearby canal where they made him lean down or kneel down and look over the water in the hopes that he would fall in and drown, but that didn't happen. So they were beating and kicking him and they also like dropped him on his head at some point and he was bleeding from his head. And we went outside to the canal. What for? I don't know, we said let's throw him in the water. He was persuading him, he said, kneel down, let's look at the water and all that, but he wouldn't. Because when we wouldn't get him down, Robert picked him up and threw him on the floor and that's where he got his bump on his head. From the canal, they walked to the railway with James, who was crying and he was bleeding from the head. They were seen punching and kicking him and there were so many witnesses who saw them. There were 38 official witnesses who had come forward to say that they had definitely seen the three boys together and one witness went up to them, asked, you know, what was wrong if they needed any help and their story was, this is our brother, he just fell over and we're just trying to find mum so that we can bring him back to them and she was like, okay, you know, hope you're safe and then just left them. And another older woman, and this is the one that really gets me, saw the two boys with James, went up to them, asked what was wrong. They said that they didn't know him, that they found him and he was crying and bleeding and they were trying to take him to the police station. And this woman said, okay, as long as you go straight to the police station. I just can't, cannot wrap my head around the fact that she didn't, they were 10 and a lot of people including John's solicitor said that they looked eight and James was two. So the fact that they said that he was hurt, they were taking him to a police station and she didn't offer to take them herself or to look after them and just let them go and was like, as long as you go straight there, I just can't, just cannot get over it. These people, these witnesses also came under a lot of media scrutiny for not doing anything. And I think rightfully so. Like I, I just cannot believe she was like, okay, as long as you go straight to the police station. She could have literally saved that boy's life. Once they got to the railway lines, the two boys tortured James and beat him and they used some of the items that they had stolen, such as the blue paint and the batteries. And I'm honestly not even gonna go into detail about what they did to torture them, torture him and how they tortured him because I don't think it's necessary to go into detail. It is so incredibly horrific and so incredibly sad. I just don't feel the need to say it. All you really need to know is that they horrifically tortured this young two-year-old boy. Um, if you do want to know exactly what they did, the information is readily available on Google. They also describe it in the interviews that they did, some of it, um, but I don't feel like it's necessary to go into detail. I literally cried when I found out exactly what they did. This boy was two years old and every time I see a photo of him now, I honestly want to cry. Basically, they beat him and tortured him so badly that he had over 42 injuries on his head, all of which was so incredibly horrific that they weren't able to determine which of them was the fatal blow. The boys then undressed him from the waist down, and I'm not going to go into detail and talk about why this was theorized, but it was theorized that there was some sort of sexual assault that took place in the torture. Again, that information is readily available on Google. Um... But also knowing who John Venables is now, and if you guys don't know that information, we'll get into that later in the video. But I don't think it's far-fetched to say that there was some sort of sexual assault that took place. At this point, James was dead and they wanted to make it look like an accident. So they laid his half-naked body down on the railway tracks, waited until they saw a train coming and then left. And the train came and cut... James Bulger's body in half. And just a side note here, I feel like the fact that they wanted it to look like an accident shows that they knew exactly what they were doing and they knew that it was wrong. So Robert Thompson and John Venables were charged with murder, abduction, and attempted abduction for the first boy that they tried to abduct. Their first appearance in court was on the 22nd of February and this was in the Safton Magistrates Court, which is where they would set the date for their 
official trial. At this stage, they were just known as Child A and Child B in an effort to conceal their identities from the public because the public was angry and there were riots, like violent riots that took place outside of the magistr magistrate's court when they had their first appearance. At this appearance, their trial was set for the 7th of November later that year. Their trial took place at the Preston Crown Court and there were 44 seats there available to the public and over 500 people queued up overnight, not only to get these seats, but again, there were some very angry crowds outside at the start of their trial or through, throughout their 17 day trial. This case was huge, not only because of the horrific crime, the fact that her, the horrific crime was carried out by two 10 year old boys, but also due to the fact that in the UK, the age of criminal responsibility is 10 years old, which was very controversial. And a lot of people believe that it should be changed and that this case shouldn't set the age for of criminal responsibility. At the trial, they actually had to raise the base of the dock floor 18 inches so that the boys could see over it, which it just goes to show like a courtroom is meant for adults, not children. So it, it it's just crazy that two 10 year old boys were there being tried for murder. They were actually the two youngest children to be accused of murder in the UK in the 20th century. Anyway, in their trial, the details of how they abducted, murdered and tortured two year old James Bulger came to light and they had forensic evidence to prove it. They outlined that Thompson was the one who took the lead, but it was John who suggested abducting the child and it was John who suggested putting him on the railway. The trial lasted 17 days and on the 24th of November in 1993, 11 years old at this time, Robert Thompson and John Venables were convicted of the murder of James Bulger. They were sentenced to eight years and the judge decided to release their real names as well as their school photos, but said that no more information could ever be released about them and that they would be given new identities once they were out of once they had finished serving their time and it was also some kind of law I don't remember exactly what it's called but if any information was released about their new identities the people who released that information would go to jail now as I'm sure you can imagine and I'm sure you are right now people were absolutely outraged about the fact that they only got eight years for what they did to that poor innocent little boy. Due to public outcry, their cases were actually, or their sentences were actually reviewed and were raised to 10 years, but this was not enough. So a national use newspaper ended up starting a petition which got over 280,000 signatures to raise the sentencing once again. And the government heard this and due to public outcry decided to raise it themselves to 15 years which the courts didn't like they were like no you you can't come in you're the government you cannot come in this is our place so they lowered it back to 10 years lawyers of the boys also argued that the fact that they were tried in an adult court and the fact that the trial was so public made it so that the boys couldn't have a fair trial so and get this, John Venables was awarded £29,000 as compensation and Robert Thompson was awarded £15,000 after what they did to that little boy. And on top of that, they were ordered to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which means indefinitely for a minimum of eight years and she could decide when they could be released. So no sentence in the end really. So Venables was sent to the Vardy house, which was an eight bed section of the Red Bank secure unit, which was in St. Helens in Merseyside. Thompson was sent to a separate facility. He was sent to the Barton Moss secure unit, which was in Manchester. Honestly, this is where it gets really bad. If you thought that it wasn't bad already, their punishment was seriously more like a reward. It was like a holiday. It was better than how they were living before they committed the murder. They got a great education with one-on-one -on -one tutoring for their GCSEs and A-levels, which is crazy because most people don't even have that in 
the real world. They had great food, they had TVs in their cell rooms, they had movies, they had video games. They got to decorate their rooms. I know Thompson had like duvet covers of like the Liverpool football team, posters all over the walls. Literally just one month after getting in, they were able to go out on excursions. They went to the park, they went to the cinema, they went to the shops where they were given an allowance and were able to buy designer clothes. Thompson got to go swimming once a month because that was his favourite hobby. So they would go out to the swimming pool, swimming bath, whatever they called it. And on the way back, he would get McDonald's. So it was just, it was such a joke. Like they were living better lives than people outside of prison who hadn't committed murder. The boys clearly didn't feel any remorse about what they had done. First of all, what I forgot to mention is that in the trial, John Venables was crying, but Robert Thompson showed absolutely no emotion whatsoever and just stared the detective in the eyes like when he was getting sentenced. An inmate who was serving time with Venables said that Venables would often talk about what he did to James and he would laugh about it. and people started beating him up. Like he punched John Venables in the face because of this, because he just felt no remorse at all. The boys were said to be suffering PTSD, John Venables more than Robert Thompson, which means they knew what they did was bad. Um, John was suffering it more so than Robert. He was ha suffering from night terrors and flashbacks of what he did, but he was still laughing about it. For the first amount of time that they were in there, like officers or guards would have to lock the doors or close the doors after the boys went into a room so that other inmates couldn't try and beat them up. But they did end up having interactions and that's when that occurred. Another inmate who served five years with Thompson said that Thompson was abusive and one time on the TV, like his case came up in his photo and he stormed into his room, like barged in there, staff followed him and he was like, yelling at them and abusing them and swearing at them. On top of this, what I find crazy is that neither of these boys ever served time in adult prison. And when Venables was 17, he actually had sex with a female guard at his prison, prison facility, and she was suspended. But it was like a holiday is what I'm trying to get at. Like, it's crazy. It costs over 3,000 pounds a week to house one of these boys like that's insane and on top of that it costs one and a half million pounds for their new identities like it is seriously like they were being rewarded in 1999 the european court decided that their trials were not fair trials and so their sentences were reviewed again they decided to release them in june of 2001 the only terms of their release was obviously that they couldn't see each other, they couldn't contact each other if they did find, find out each other's new identities. They weren't able to contact James Bolger's family, no excessive drinking, and they weren't able to return to the Merseyside area. Over three people had been arrested and sent to jail for releasing information about their new identities. After their release, Robert Thompson seemed to have been rehabilitated he moved in with his long-term boyfriend and they he hasn't been heard from since and hasn't reoffended. So Venables went on to offend again multiple times. In 2008, he was arrested twice, once for a drunken brawl and once for possession of cocaine. In 2010, he pled guilty to possession of child pornography. He had over 100 images found on his computer and was sentenced to two years jail time. It also came out that he had revealed his own identity on a number of occasions and was violating his parole the entire time since he got out of jail and had been in Merseyside and Liverpool so many times going to bars, drinking, all sorts, all the time, which was a direct violation of his parole. So he actually had to be given another new identity because he had been leaking his own identity and his identity had also been leaked online, which leaking the identities of John Venables and Robert Thompson actually carries up to a two year prison sentence. In February of 2008, John Venables actually pleaded guilty 
once again to possession of indecent images of children. He admitted to being in possession of 392 category A child pornography photos, which is a like category A is child pornography that includes sexual penetration. He also had 148 category B photos, which category B was sexual photos or photos of children completing sexual acts but without penetration and he had over 600 photos of category C child pornography which is like the general term for all pornography that isn't category A and category B. He was then sentenced to another three years and four months in prison and that is where we're at now and actually due to John Venable's reoffending, it's deemed that he's a danger to society by well mainly by James Bolger's father, who is petitioning to have his true identity revealed because he just keeps violating his probation and keeps reoffending, so he is petitioning to have his true identity revealed. Another thing that I just wanted to mention before this video comes to an end is that I just, it's just something I thought was really sad is that James was so incredibly precious to Denise and Ralph and more so because they had just had a stillbirth of a daughter. So James was so precious to them. So, you know, it was just, they were really strong to be able to hold it together after losing two children. At the time of the trial of Thompson and Venables, they actually found out they were pregnant with James's brother, Michael. Their marriage did end up falling apart because they were just so like just so torn apart because of the entire case. Denise went on to marry an electrician called Stuart and they had two more children together. So yeah, that brings us to the end of today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed and hopefully I will see you in my next one. Bye guys.